Section 4. Artillery Support of Between the Lines by Boy de Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Supported by a close and accurate artillery fire. Extract from Official Dispatch. From his position in the observation post, the artillery forward officer watched the fight raging along his front much as a spectator in the grandstand watches a football match. Through his glasses he could see every detail and movement of the fighters, see even their facial expressions, the grip of hands about their weapons. Queerly enough, it was something like looking at the dumb show of a cinema film. He could see a rifle pointed and the spit of fire from the muzzle without hearing any report, could see an officer gesticulating and his mouth opening and closing in obvious stentorian shoutings without hearing the faintest sound of his voice, could even see the quick flash and puffing smoke of a grenade without catching the crash of its explosion. It was not that he was too far off to hear all these sounds, but simply because individually they were drowned in the continuous ear-filling roar of the battle. The struggle was keenly interesting and desperately exciting, even from a spectator's point of view, and the interest and excitement were the greater to the forward officer, because he was playing a part, and an important part, in the great game spread before him. Beyond the line of a section of the British front, white smoke puffs were constantly bursting. Over his head a succession of shells streamed rushing and shrieking, and the place where each of these puffs burst depended on him. Each shell that roared overhead came in answer to his call. He was observing, for a six-gun battery, concealed behind a gentle slope over a mile away, to his right rear, and since the gunners at the battery could see nothing of the fight, nothing of their target, not even the burst of a single one of their shells, they depended solely on their forward officer to correct their aim and direct their fire. All along the front, or rather both the fronts, for the German batteries worked on exactly the same system, the batteries were pouring down their shells, and each battery was dependent for the accuracy of its fire on its own observing officer, crouching somewhere up in front and overlooking his battery's zone. The fighting line surged forward or swayed back, checked and halted, moved again, now rapidly, now slowly and staggeringly, curved forward here and dented in there, striving fiercely to hold its ground in this place, driving forward in that, or breaking, reeling back into the arms of the supports, swirling forward with them again. But no matter whether the lines moved forward or back, fast or slow, raggedly and unevenly, or in one long, close-locked line, ever and always the shells soared over and burst beyond the line, just far enough barely to clear it if the fight were at close quarters, reaching out and on a hundred, two hundred yards when the fighters drew apart for a moment, always clear of their own infantry, and exactly as possible on the fighting line of the enemy, for such is the essence of close and accurate artillery support. The forward observing officer, perched precariously in an angle of the walls of a ruined cottage, stared through his glasses at the confusion of the fight for hour after hour, until his eyes ached and his vision swam. The forward officer had been there since daybreak, and because no shells obviously aimed at his station had bombarded him, plenty of chance ones had come very close, but of course they didn't count, he was satisfied that he was reasonably secure, and told his major, back at the battery, so over his telephone. The succession of attack and counter-attack had ceased for the time being, and the forward officer let his glasses drop and shut his aching eyes for a moment. But almost immediately he had to open them and lift his head carefully to peer out over the top of the broken wall, for the sudden crash of reopening rifle fire warned him that another move was coming. From far out on his left, beyond the range of his vision, the fire began. It beat down, wave after wave, toward his front, crossed it, and went rolling on beyond his right, the initiative came from the British side, and taking it as the prelude of an attack, developing perhaps out of sight on his left, the forward officer called up his battery and quickened the rate of its fire upon the German line. In a few minutes he caught a quick stir in the British line, 
a glimpse of the row of khaki figures clambering from their trench and the flickering flash of their bayonets and in an instant the flat ground beyond the trench was covered with running figures this made a fair target that the german gunners rifles and maxims were quick to leap upon the german trench streamed fire the german shells shrapnel and high explosive blew gaping rents in the running line the line staggered and flinched halted recovered and went on again leaving the ground behind it dotted with sprawling figures the space covered by the forward officer's zone was flat and bare of cover clear to the german trench two hundred yards away it was too deadly a stretch for that gallant line to cover and before it was halfway across it faltered again hung irresolute and flung itself prone to the ground the level edge of the german trench suddenly became serrated with bobbing heads flickered with moving figures and the next moment was hidden by the swarm of men that leaped from it and came charging across the open this line too withered and wilted under the fire that smote it but it gathered itself and hurled on again the forward officer called down the shortening ranges to the guns and the answering shrapnel fell fiercely on the german line and tore it to fragments but the fragments still advanced the remnant of the british line rose and flung forward to meet it and as the two clashed the supports from either side poured out to help as the dense mass of germans emerged and knitted into close formation the forward officer reeled off swift orders to the telephone the shrieking tempest of his shells fell upon the mass struck and slew wholesale struck and slew again the mass shivered and broke but although part of it vanished back under the cover of the trench although another part lay piled in a wreckage of dead and wounded a third part straggled forward and charged into the fight the british line was overborne and pushing struggling back until new supports brought it fresh life and turned the tide again the germans surviving the charge were killed wounded or taken prisoners and the forward officer lifting his fire and pouring it on the german trench checked for the moment any further rush of reinforcements the british line ran forward to a field track running parallel to the trenches and nearly midway between them flung itself down to escape the bullets that stormed across and began as rapidly as the men's cramped position would allow to dig themselves in to their right and left the field track sank a foot or two below the surface of the field and this scanty but precious shelter had allowed the rest of the line to stop halfway across and hold on to get its breath and allow a constant spray of supports to dash across the open and reinforce it now the centre where the track ran bare and flat across the field plied frantic shovels to heap up some sort of cover that would allow them also to hang on in conformation of the whole line and gather breath and reinforcements for the next rush the germans saw plainly enough what was the plan and took instant steps to upset it their first and best chance was to thrust hard at the weak and ill-protected centre overwhelm it and then roll up the lines to right and left of it a tornado of shell fire ushered in the new assault the shells burst in running crashes up and down the forward line and up and down the british trench behind it driving squalls of shrapnel swept the ground between the two and in addition a storm of rifle and machine-gun bullets rained along the scanty parapet whistling and droned and hissed and across the open and then suddenly the assault was launched from all along the german line at the same instant a shell struck the wall of the forward officer's station burst with a terrific crash swept three parts of the remaining wall away in a cloud of shrieking splinters and swirling dust of brick and plaster and threw the forward officer headlong half a dozen yards by some miracle he was untouched his first thought was for the telephone the connecting link with his guns he scrambled over the debris to the dugout or shelter pit behind his corner and found telephonist and telephone intact he dropped on hands and knees and crawled over the rubble and out beyond the end of the wall for the cloud of smoke and plaster and brick dust still hung heavily about the ruin here in the open as he was the air sang like tense harp strings to the passage of innumerable bullets the ground about his feet danced to their drumming flicked and spat little spurts of mud all over him 
but the forward officer paid little heed to these things. For one moment his gaze was riveted, horror-stricken, on the scene of the fight. The next he was on his feet, heedless of the singing bullets, heedless of the roar and crash of another shell that hit the ground and flung a cartload of earth and mud whizzing and thumping about him, heedless of everything, except the need to get quickly to the telephone. "'Tell the battery! Germans advancing! Heavy attack on our front!' he panted to the telephonist, jumping across to his corner and heaving himself up into place. The dust had cleared now so that he could see, and what he could see made him catch his breath. An almost solid line of Germans were clear of their trenches and pushing rapidly across the open on the weak center, and the battery shells were falling behind the German line and still on their trenches. Swiftly the forward officer began to reel off his corrections of angles and range, and as the telephonist passed them on, gun after gun began to pitch its shells on the advancing line. The British rifles were busy, too, and their fire rose in one continuous roar. But the fire was weakest from the thin center line, the spot where the attack was heaviest. The guns were in full play again, and the shells were blasting quick gaps out of the advancing line. But the line came on. The rifles beat upon it, and a machine gun on the less heavily pressed left turned and mowed the Germans down in swaths. Still the line came on stubbornly. It was broken and ragged now, and advanced slowly, because the front ranks were constantly melting away under the British fire. The forward officer watched with straining eyes glued to his glasses. A shell whooped past close over his head and burst just beyond him. He neither turned his head nor moved his glasses. One, two, three, four burst short, and splinters and bullets sang past him. Two more burst overhead, and the shrapnel crashed and rattled amongst the stone and brick of the ruins. Without moving, the forward officer began to call a fresh string of orders. The rush of his shell ceased for a moment while the gunners adjusted the new angles and ranges. Number one fired, two fired, three, four, five, six fired, sir, called the telephonist, and as he spoke there came the shrieks of the shells, and the white puffs of the bursts low down and between the prone British line and the advancing Germans. Number three, one oh minutes more left, shouted the forward officer. Number five, add twenty-five, repeat. Again came the running bursts and the puffing white smoke, and satisfied this time with their line, position, and distance, the forward officer shouted for gunfire, jumped down and across to the telephonist's shelter pit. "'I'm putting a belt of fire just ahead of our line,' he shouted, curving his fingers about his lips and the mouthpiece in an attempt to shut out the uproar around them. "'If they can come through it, we're done. Infantry can't hold them. G give me every round you can, and as fast as you can, please.' He ran back to his place. A cataract of shells poured their shrapnel down along a line of which the nearest edge was a bare twenty yards from the British front. The forward officer— fixed his eyes on the string of white smoke puffs with their center of winking flame that burst and burst and burst unceasingly. If one showed out of its proper place, he shouted to the telephonist and named the delinquent gun and asked for the lay and functioning to be checked. The advancing Germans reached at last the strip of ground where his shrapnel hailed and lashed, reached the strip and pushed into it, but not past it. Up to the shrapnel zone, the advance could press. Through it, it could not. Under the shrapnel, nothing could live. It swept the ground in driving gust on gust, swept and besumed it bare of life. Here and there, in ones and twos and little knots and groups, the Germans strove desperately to push on. They came as far as that deadly fire belt, and in ones and twos and little knots and groups, they stayed there and died. Supports hurried up and hurled themselves in, and a spasm of fresh strength and fury lifted the line and heaved it forward. So far the fire of its fury brought it, and there the hosing shrapnel met it, swept down and washed it away, and beat it out to the last spark, and the last man. But from the German trenches another assault was forming. From the German batteries another squall of shell-fire smote the British line, and to his horror— 
the forward officer saw his own shells coming slower and slower the smoke burst growing irregular and slower again he leaped down and rushed to the telephone back in the battery the telephone wires ran into a dugout that was the brain centre of the guns and from here the forward officer's directions emerged and were translated to the gunners through the battery commander and the battery sergeant major's megaphone all the morning the gunners followed those orders blindly slewing the hot gun muzzles a fraction this way or that making minute adjustments on sights and range drums and shell fuses they could see no glimpse of the fight but more or less accurately they could follow its varying fortunes and trace its movements by the orders that came through to them when they had to send their shells further back the enemy obviously were being pressed back when the fire had to be brought closer the enemy were closer an urgent call for rapid fire with an increasing range meant our infantry attacking with a lessening range their being attacked occasionally the battery commander passed to the section commanders items of news from the forward officer and they in turn told the numbers one in charge of the guns and the gun detachments such a message was passed along when the forward officer telephoned news of the heavy pressure on the weakened centre every man in the battery knew what was expected and detachment vied with detachment in the speedy correcting of aim and range and the rapid service of their guns when the order came for a round of battery fire which calls for the guns to fire in their turn from right to left one gun was a few seconds late in reporting ready and every other man in every other gun fretted and chafed impatiently as if each second had been an hour at another message from the forward officer the battery commander called for section commanders the sergeant major clapped megaphone to mouth and shouted and two young subalterns and a sergeant jumped from their places and raced for the dugout the major spoke rapidly and tersely we are putting down a belt of shrapnel in front of our own infantry very close to them you know what that means the most careful and exact laying and fusing and fire as hot and heavy as you can make it the infantry can't hold them they're depending on us the line depends on us tell your men so be off now the three saluted whirled on their heels and were off they told their men and the men strained every nerve to answer adequately to the call upon them the rate of fire worked up faster and faster between the thunder claps of the gun the sergeant major's megaphone bellowed number six check your lay number six missed the message but the nearest gun caught the word and passed it along the section commander heard saluted to show he had heard and understood and ran himself to check the layer's aim up to now the battery had worked without coming under any serious fire there were always plenty of rifle bullets coming over and an occasional one of the shells that roared constantly passed or over fell amongst the guns a few men had been wounded and one had been killed and that was all then quite suddenly a tempest of high explosive shell rained down on the battery in front of behind over and amongst the guns instinctively the men hesitated in their work but the next instant the voices of the section commanders brought them to themselves there were shelter pits and dugouts close by and without urgent need of their fire the guns might be left while the gunners took cover till the storm was over but there could be no thought of that now while the picture was in everyone's mind of the infantry out there being hard pressed and overborne by the weight of the assault so the gunners stayed by their guns and loaded laid and fired as fast as they could serve their pieces the gun shields gave little or no protection from high explosive shells because these burst overhead and fling their fragments straight down burst in rear and hurled jagged splinters outwards in every direction the men were as open and unprotected to them as bare flesh is to bullet and cold steel but they knelt or sat in their places and pushed their work into a speed that was only limited by the need for absolute accuracy a shell burst close in rear of number one gun and the whirlwind of splinters and bullets struck down half the detachment at a blow the fallen men were lifted clear the remaining gunners took up their appointed share of the lost men's duties a shell was slung in the breech slammed shut the firing level jerked and number one gun was in action again and firing almost as fast as before 
The sergeant in charge of another gun was killed instantaneously by a shrapnel bullet in the head. His place was taken by the next senior before the last convulsive tremors had passed through the dead man's muscles, and the gun kept on firing without missing a round. The shell fire grew more and more intense. The air was thick and choking with smoke and chemical fumes, and vibrant with the rush and shriek of the shells, the hum of bullets and the ugly whirl of splinters, the crash of impacting shells and ear-splitting crack of the gun's discharge, the rip of shrapnel on the wet ground, and metallic clang of bullets and steel fragments on the gun shields and mountings. But through all the inferno the gunners worked on, swiftly but methodically. After each shot the layers glared anxiously into the eyepiece of their sights, and made minute movements of elevating and traversing wheels. The men at the range drums examined them carefully and adjusted them exactly. The fuse setters twisted the rings, marking the fuse's time of burning until they were correct literally to the hair line, every man working as if the gun were shooting for a prize competition cup. Their care, as well as their speed, was needed, for more than any cup good men's lives were at stake, and hanging on their close and accurate shooting. For if the sights were a shade to right or left of their aiming point, if the range were shortened by a fractional turn of the drum, if a fuse was wrongly set to one of the scores of tiny marks on its ring, that shell might fall on the British line, take toll of the lives of friend instead of foe, go to break down the hard-pressed British resistance instead of upholding it. Man after man was hit by shell splinter or bullet, but no man left his place unless he was too badly injured to carry on. The seriously wounded dragged themselves clear as best they could and crawled to any cover from the bursting shells. The dead lay where they fell. The detachments were reduced to skeleton crews. One section commander laid and fired a gun. Another, with a smashed thigh, sat and set fuses until he fainted from loss of blood and from pain. The battery commander took the telephone himself and sent the telephonist to help the guns, and when a bursting shell tore out one side of the sandbags of the dugout, the battery commander rescued himself and the instrument from the wreckage, mended the broken wire, and sat in the open, alternatively listening at the receiver and yelling exhortation and advice to the gunners through the sergeant major's megaphone. The sergeant major had gone on the run to round up every available man, and brought back at the double the battery cooks, officers, grooms, mess orderlies, and servants. The slackening fire of the battery spurted again, and ran up to something like its own rate. And the Major cheered the men on to a last effort, shouting the forward officer's message that the attack was failing, was breaking, was being wiped out mainly by the battery's fire. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, the tornado of shell-fire about them ceased, shifted its storm center, and fell roaring and crashing and hammering on an empty hedge and ditch a full three hundred yards away. And at the same moment, the Major shouted exultingly, They're done! He bellowed down the megaphone, They're beat! The attack! And he fell back on the forward officer's own words, The attack is blotted out! whereat the panting gunners cheered faintly and short-windedly and took contentedly the following string of orders to lengthen the range and slacken the rate of fire. And the battery made shift to move its dead from amongst the gun and wagon wheels, to bandage and tie up its wounded with first field dressings, to shuffle and sort the detachments and redistribute the remaining men in fair proportion amongst the remaining guns, to telephone the brigade headquarters, to ask for stretcher-bearers and ambulance and more shells, doing it all, as it were, with one hand, while the other kept the guns going, and the shells pounding down their appointed paths. For the doing of two or more things at once, and doing them rapidly, exactly, and efficiently, and while in addition highly unpleasant things are being done to them, is all a part of the gunner's game of close and accurate artillery support. End of section 4